Right. Well, I'll be talking about um, challenging innovative case studies in uh, grand improvement and design. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, Renata, for the very kind introductions. And, you know, there's a very common theme uh, Renato introduced about Carl, my grandfather visiting and learning about tropical soils. To me, understanding the genesis of the soils is always very, very important. And one of the things that I always find very important is to understand where the soils um, come from. And um, then, given that we have a lot of difficult soils are problematic because they might be shrink swell, they might collapse, they might uh, do a lot of settlement, we can't build on them. We need to do ground improvement. However, unless you understand what are the issues behind the soil, what, how it was um, derived, you can't actually do your ground improvement. And I'm going to talk about some examples where we've used lots of different um, types of, of ground improvement and then some of the issues with each one of those and, and some of the lessons to be learned of, of those from using those ground improvements. And also demonstrating that you don't always need to, to use ground improvement to achieve the desired outcomes. And, you know, one of the very big problems is there are many different types. Most are controversial for one reason or another. And usually, you know, there's this cost versus time element. You know, usually the slower you go, the cheaper um, the ground improvement, the faster, the more expensive, because you need to use a much more energy intensive of system. And, in today's age with sustainability, you know, we need to be thinking a lot more about planning in advance and using these slower, cheaper type um, ground improvements. But having said that, you need to compare like with like. Most of the ground improvements are either aimed at densification of, of the soil or, or providing reinforcement. Um, when I'm Talk about reinforcement. I'm, I'm saying you're adding stiffness either through deep soil mixing or adding piles or stone columns or something like that. But when you're looking at it, you've got to look at what is the ground improvement doing on the overall behavior on the overall behavior of the system. Some ground improvements have unintended side effects, which um, may cause problems. And, and I'll discuss that in a moment. And of course, you always have to bear in mind, what are you doing? What is it for? Um, and how are you going to prove what you've done um, works? You know, and, and some of the simple slower ones is just adding a, a preload, putting some soil um, on, to, on top of the ground or you, to take it up to the current uh, or the design level of, of your embankment or or reclamation, um, or you might um, add a surcharge as well to try and speed things up. You might add wicks to the system, or you might um, mix some binders into the soil or, or inclusions. Um, each one of these might appear faster, um, but not necessarily, um, but certainly the expense goes up quite considerably. And here are some of the ways you can add, add um, materials to the ground, you know, compaction grout and vibro replacement, stone columns, deep soil mixing, mass mixing, um, rapid impact, dynamic, jet grouting, polyurethane. And there are many more and more being developed as, as we go. Now I'm going to go jump into um, one very big project I was involved with, um, well, actually, um, between five and 10 years ago now, but it involved almost all of these different techniques. And there were a lot of separate issues as, as we go through. So we're looking at a port facility 
we've got a single railway line and that railway line had to split up. It had some deposition yards here, but this area through here was very, going to be developed for additional um, deposition lines. That meant that this line had to be split here or actually down here. And we had to get a new line that could both um, take trains and put trains back onto the system. We had um, wetlands all around that we could not disturb. Um, there were other infrastructure around here which also could not be disturbed. So very, very tight constraints. The equipment itself was very sensitive to differential movements. Most of the soils were sedimentary, soft sedimentary soils, but they had been um, leached and going through wet dry cycles in place as they were being deposited. And there were residual soils. Australia has um, the joys, if you can call it that, of having young sedimentary soils right next to very old, highly weathered uh, residual soils, very similar to many of the tropical soils um, that you have. So yes, we're looking at, at a major expansion through here. And you know, you can see some of the um, product heaps um, here. Um, very big, You've got these big mobile equipment that really was um, insensitive to, to uh, differential movements. <clears throat> so as you can see, we had a lot of, of different ground improvement techniques that are being used. And each one had its successes and had its failures. So if we focus on one particular area, I'm going to just take um, two areas that I'm going to look at. You can see where they're, they're splitting the line. These are new lines that we had to then merge into the tracks, you know, one going in, one coming out, and we had to make a new arrival road and an all arrival road. And we had to do it in a way that we kept all of the works um, moving, we could not disrupt um, train movements except for sp specified closures where they could move lines from one embankment to another embankment. I'm not I don't have time to go through all of the things. What I'm going to focus on is first off, a embankment widening up here so they could stack extra trains and demonstrate if you understand the soils, you don't actually need ground improvement. Um, always, um, there are other ways of achieving the desired outcomes. And then we're going to focus on, on this bridge right here, um, where we had to keep um, the line that was um, pre-made open while we build these embankments on either side, some of the ground improvements, some of the modeling techniques, and some of the things that people forgot about um, during the process. So the first project, we had to do you know, like 800 meters of embankment widening um, so they could stack a train there uh, just to shuffle trains. There's a gas easement, a 300 diameter pipeline, gas pipeline, high pressure gas pipeline of unknown condition. So it was had to be treated as being very, very sensitive. There's also a national park just on the other side of the gas pipeline that we couldn't touch. This was the original design. People wanted to cut this embankment. Not a good idea. You have 100, 120 car trains fully loaded. I'm going by here. Um, not a good idea to cut away like that. And they wanted to put in um, grout injected columns, which would be cause massive lateral movements, which could disrupt the pipeline um, to build what you can see in the dotted outline there. And this is a picture of, of, of one of the sites. You've got the embankment in, in behind, um, no trains there, but you can see the wetlands and everything else. Uh, and uh, so you can see in full detail the proposed works. Um, not not a good idea, not a good idea given the situations. 
and it wasn't necessary. So we had lots of information. We could um, calibrate the parameters from trial embankments um, nearby. We modeled everything, and, and, and in this case, Plaxis using the soft soil creep model. And we could actually demonstrate that the models predicted strengths and, and behaviors that corresponded to what we saw um, in the field. And we had to go out and do um, special trials to prove because a lot of the lower bound were taken off the embankment and, and people were using that to design things when in fact we needed to look at the upper bound, which was underneath the embankment. And you can see that when we actually got out and measured, um, we had very good um, match. Um, so we, we can develop very good matches um, using the more advanced soil models. This is what we came up with. We can step, we kept the trains going, we could step and cut in, we could build our retaining walls. We had a more sophisticated uh, stratigraphy through here. But what it showed was that, one, we didn't need ground improvement. And secondly, there'd be very small amounts of, of settlement uh, on the new track, which proved to be the case in, in practice. Um, we got less than 25 millimeters of movement, and most of that, we believe, was actually settling of the ballast under the initial loads. It's still working perfectly. This was five, five six years ago. Um, there's been no adverse movement whatsoever. And you can see the final product through here. Um, we had automatic um, inclinometers or rather I should say a string of electrocells that were powered by um, solar cells and they reported um, readings at regular intervals. Uh, very important to demonstrate the safety of the entire system. Now, moving on, I'm conscious of, of time. Um, focusing on the bridge now, um, we had to do full 3D models there because we had um, two abutments um, and we couldn't put the entire bridge into one um, model. And um, so, so we did two separate models because of the very curved nature and um, also very different ground conditions on, on every side. As you can see, we have very soft soils. Um, again, we've got sand layers, so you can expect maybe rapid movements. Um, but the soft clay was also known to uh, be creep a lot, so people were very nervous about it. So you can see here um the the split and the, the very curved nature of everything and also um this railway that we also had to look at so we're focusing predominantly on this side um we can see the embankment um what we modeled K key thing here is you don't have to model everything you need to be selective about what you model and and how you model it um, you can see we had um, piles, we had concrete slabs, we had geotextiles. Um, th through here, we had this concrete slab that was modeled. Um, and we had to make uh, modifications because um, Plaxis at the time couldn't handle the density that was there. But we could demonstrate, we could simplify the models um, quite adequately. But the key thing that I wanted to focus on here is understanding what the model is telling you and why it's telling you. Because what we realized um, was that we had this zone here of excess settlement. It was very high, even everything else was working. And that was a problem. Um, because we were only allowed limited number of settlements. You know, even here, we were up at, at close to the maximum um, allowable um, just because of the flow on effects. 
but you can see we have over here this the zone of excess movement and um, we had to investigate why and and the problem was is that the original design was only looking at 1d or 2d sections didn't look at, at things uh, just oh yeah we're, we're fine but when we look at the detail you know this all looks good we're taking the loads down um, to a lower level but when we start looking carefully we start realizing that hey part of the embankment was taken off of the treatment zone it was generating excess shearing which was generating excess pore pressures which developed excess of settlement because the treatment zone wasn't taken wide enough to cover the entire embankment and that's something you know why i emphasize that well first off you need to understand the soils but you need to understand what are the ground treatments doing and all all the time I see um, people treating only the, uh, what they think is the key zone and forgetting about these lower stability berms and things like that. And that can generate a lot of excess pro uh, pore pressure and a lot of problems. And part of this, I think, is we, we taught about 1D consolidation and it's often good enough but you need to think about the edges because shearing can generate as much excess pore pressure as a pure load so you don't need a lot of load to generate shearing which will then generate a, a lot of of uh, movement and, and ongoing settlement and consolidation so Yes, there's a lot of ground improvements. I've only touched on the surface of, of, of this, but I really want to emphasize you need to understand the site and the site history. You need to understand what spells success. Um, what does it mean? What does it look like? Why are you doing ground improvement? Do you really, really need it? I'm working on a project right now where the original design involved many millions of dollars of ground improvement. We've eliminated virtually all of that um, because you don't need it. Uh, the ground has already been treated satisfactorily. And um, this leads to a much better and much more robust outcome than just putting in ground improvement willy nilly because sometimes ground improvement creates more problems than it solves. So now I think I will hand over to the floor. Okay, great. Um, I would like to invite my friends to make some questions. Uh, and share with us uh, because I, I didn't see anyone until now. I'm gonna start with the uh, with one of mine. Uh, when you plan your field investigations, you consider uh, the CPTU. You consider pressure matter tests. Uh, what's your uh, overview of this uh, initial in investigations? Well, yes, I think that's a very good question. I, I actually have a separate talk where I outlined the need for for understanding and preparing for, for that. Um, CPTUs are, I consider, essential. <clears throat> I'm liking to add um seismic C cptu or seismic di dilatometer because the seismic measures your small strain stiffness and there's by itself it's the only direct measure of the soil property this is very important when we consider cpt pressure meter boreholes that often we are getting a disturbed large strain behavior so if you then have a small strain measure you can then have a look at the difference between them 
and that starts telling you something very important about the soil and in tropical soils residual soils or many structured soils which you will have in brazil both from your your residual tropical soils but also from your young materials where they've been deposited then dried out and then re-wetted that creates a structure in, in the soil that is very easy to lose and during, during sampling and testing yet if you understand that that structure you can use that to your advantage um, both in terms of planning your ground improvement um, and also if you're doing a, a embankment how you stage <clears throat> That, that embankment um, or your stage you're loading. Um, pressure meters, I, I like, um, but many parts where I operate, they're not very common. Um, I think it's a tool that is underused. Um, I, I, well, I like to minimize the number of boreholes um just because of sample quality and people tend to wash bore um you do need a couple of of boreholes just to calibrate uh, your cpts your dmts your pressure meters um even your your shear wave velocities to understand what what they are are telling you um and look i'll, I'll also use geophysics um, early on in the program to help tell us where do we need to target. And, you know, when you, you're targeting boreholes, one thing I need to emphasize is it's not just the weak areas. You need to have your weak areas, your strong areas, and your typical areas. Because your typical areas is your bulk of your cost. Your weak areas might be your problems, or it might be your hard areas that are the problems. So you need to understand what are your hard areas, what are your weak areas, and what they mean for your project. We are now in Brazil uh, evolving from uh, the regular uh, standard penetration test to one with more technology on board, using some uh, measurements of energy, which is very important because if you have a uh, 6% or 72% or 50% uh, equipment that uh, changes a lot your final results. I have more questions here now from Andrea Chirelli. How do the 3D finite element model behave versus the 2D models in consolidation? How about slope stabilities? So you have two questions on, on me the same phrase i think two d versus three d is always very interesting um right now the three you know from a theoretical point of of view the three d finite elements tend to be lower performing you need a lower order element it's not as good as representing the soil behavior um at, compared to the 2d and, and that's right across the board whether you're uh, no matter what program you're you're looking at the on the flip side you know like i was showing in that last um example you had highly curved elements and you could not capture the interaction properly in, in 2D. You needed the 3D to capture those interactions. So it's that trade-off of what are you trying to capture um, versus the ac order of accuracy. Many problems, if you sit down and think about it, you can actually do in 2D quite adequately um so long as you understand what you are trying to capture and the limitations a lot of people like jumping straight into 3d without doing the 2d 
and that leads to, to grief because you don't know what ballpark you're, you're actually playing in. You need to start off with the 2D, understand what are the fundamental issues, and then set up your model to capture what you're not capturing in the 2D. I have colleagues who like setting up these huge models, 3D models. It takes weeks for them to run. I can do the analyze the same problem with a series of well-selected 2D um, sections and then selected slices of 3D where I'm focusing on key elements that I can't capture in 2D. I can do that in, in days um, versus, well, the other larger model is taking weeks just to run. And then you've got weeks to analyze, got weeks to set up. Um, so there's a bit of a philosophy there. So it's, it's a bit of horses for courses, but you can get good answers from both. Slope stability, again, you know, you've got to understand that the C phi reduction is equivalent to the limit equilibrium. It's just couched in a different term. It has certain uh, limitations, uh, certain advantages. Uh, as long as you understand what it what it's telling in 3d again it's the same same thing it's it's giving you some valuable information uh, and it can give very good results I've done uh, very sophisticated slide analyses both in 2d and 3d with very very good results compared to reality However, the closer you're working to, or, or the closer your model is working to a factor of safety of one, the more unstable it is. And I've lost a lot of hair. Um, I've reverted to my childhood colors um, because of trying to build dams that had, a had genuinely a factor of safety of 1.01. .01. And I had to build it, demonstrate the instability uh, and then demonstrate that the remedial works that we're doing brings the dam up to an adequate factor of safety. And the same goes with uh, modeling some very large landslides on slick and side layers. Um, thankfully, I was only reviewing that one, but uh, my colleague who was modeling it, let's just say he turned gray prematurely. Um, but that's why I was Great. helping it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, nice approach. Uh, we, we got your philosophy. We have some great professors here in Brazilian universities. They advise us of this uh, uh, challenge of having a simplified model first, then going to something more uh, a greater scale in, in 3D models. We have another one here from Mr. Thiago Perez. What tools have been used to calibrate the soft soil grip model? Um, well, obviously, on that particular example, we had a lot of CPTs, a lot of CPTUs. We had a limited number of lab testing and I can't emphasize if you take enough, if you're taking samples, get the largest possible diameter sample you can get that you can test and make sure it has appropriate um, oh, gee, uh, um, diameter ratios so that you get a genuinely undisturbed sample. Most for example, most U100s are actually thick wall, and that has an inappropriate um, diameter ratio, and you end up with a very disturbed sample. You need a th thin wall to, to get the sample. Um, and you know, you've got to really be careful about the sample disturbance um, yeah. and, and, and you know, the treatments and, and et cetera. 
for the particular example that we used, because of the sample disturbance, the lab testing was not reliable. Um, the samples were too heavily disturbed. Um, what we relied on a lot was there was a trial embankment literally on the other side of the tracks from the site. So we could, and we had very good measurements um, from that trial embankment. So that was one of our major tools for calibrating. Now we had approximate uh, results uh, from the CPTs, from the um, lab tests. Um, we had the trial embankment, which actually pointed us in the direction as to how badly disturbed the lab tests were. The final test was we sent a guy out in the field to take shear veins and you know, basically we predicted what those shear veins would be before he went out and, and but he didn't know what that what the results were. And then so we could then compare the that field vein against um, our predicted strengths um, that we were predicting. And there was very good correlation. So we were quite confident that we had a, a very good calibration. Great. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask one question later. Uh, I wonder what was the treatment to reduce that uh, pore water pressure? But don't answer now because we have more questions. I, I made mine. If we have time, you, you can answer that. Sure. Okay. So now, Mr. Diego Yanis, on the presented case, were the compressibility parameters based on laboratory or field tests? Were these two compared and could talk a little about the differences? <laughs> um, we looked at both the field and the laboratory and we also considered site history you know from trial embankments on the site um past observed behavior there was very significant differences between the field compressibilities and the lab lab results most of which was ascribed to the sample disturbance. There is also a issue, and I've talked about the structure, the structuration in the, in the soil. So a lot of the sedimentary soils, especially if you go through wet dry cycles, or depending on on the materials, they can develop a, a mechanical structure that I put a, akin to your house of cards. I'm sure all being good engineers, you've built card castles as a youth. And if you think about those, if you build up a couple layers, they're actually quite stiff in compression, but very weak in shear. The materials on site were very classically that way, they were quite stiff. So, so long as you didn't collapse the structure, you got very, very little movement. If you collapse the structure, either through shear or overloading the soil, then you got lots and lots and lots of movement. Now, so for many of the East Coast Australian soils, you can build embankments up to three to four meters high with almost no movement. And then all of a sudden you swap over, you're collapsing that structure and we jump to hundreds of millimeters of, of movement and a lot of creep as well, depending on, on, on the situation. So this is one of the problems. You know, if you take the CPT by itself, that's measuring a collapsed structure stiffness. Whereas if you take um, some of the trial embankment, the early stages, you got the uncollapsed stiffness. And, um, and the differences are like an order of magnitude. Um, or more, and, um, and so it's just understanding and, and, and trying to co collect that difference. And that's why like the shear wave test, 
is because if I have a big difference between my shear wave stiffness and my CPT stiffness, um, I know that we have a very sensitive soil. One, one project, we had a uh, odometer and CPT stiffness, constrained modulus of one MPA, a small strain stiffness of over 100 MPA. Wow. Um, so that gives you an idea of the nature of these soils. And if you designed on the CPT only, you would over-design everything. If you relied on the shear wave stiffness only, you'd under-design everything. Even if you cut the stiffness down by two or three, allowing for um, strain effects, um, you'd still over-design. Um, but understanding that range, you can come up with the appropriate um, design for your project. I think the greatest point of your answer is that the challenge of uh, this uh, differences between laboratory and field tests and uh, predictions, uh, even in a country that has 10 times more PB per capita, GDP, GDP per capita than us here, and you are challenging the same. <laughs> the challenges are actually the same globally. Uh, that's one of the things I find interesting is that if you understand those fundamentals, you can actually practice anywhere. If you rely purely on local practice, it will lead you astray very, very quickly. And you know, I, I find in Auckland, the majority of the pract practitioners in New Zealand can only practice in Auckland because they rely purely on local practice. Now, Auckland's fun because you've got residual soils, you've got basalt, you've got ash, you've got welded ash, you've got pumice, you've got soft soil, uh, recent soft clays. So you've got everything. But if you understand and can put them into a proper soil framework, you can take that learning and apply it globally. Uh, and that's, that's one of the fun things about ge geomechanics is if you get that fundamentals, you can work globally. And, um, you know, You've got the same things in, in, in Brazil. You've got the tropical soils, you, which have their particular sets, but they still work in the same framework. You've got um, a lot of young soft soils that are taken down the Amazon. You've got lots of rock of various kinds. Uh, Maybe not any uh, volcanoes, right? certainly not any active volcanoes. They're on the other side of the border, of course, down um, in Chile. Uh, but yeah, you know, you, you can take that learning everywhere. There is an interesting question here about the constitutive models. Could you yep. list uh, the positive and negative aspects that you could list in soil improvement? Uh, relating to this uh, constitutive models? Uh, that, that's always f fun. And, and this is one of the big problems is almost all of the constitutive models have been focused on particular aspects of soil behavior. So they all have their strengths, they all have their weaknesses. And very often I have to use two or three different constitutive models on the same problem just to capture those different aspects of, of soil behavior. Um, so, so you have to look and understand what's going on. Along with that, there is a fundamental weakness of our, our constitutive models and our, our analysis procedures at the moment and that is they don't capture the installation effects of whatever ground improvement we are, are dealing with so for example if you look at a grout injected column you're expanding a column uh, and replacing it with grout that expansion changes the soil behavior and we have no way of capturing it. 
So there are some very advanced soil models, which are almost academic, which go part way towards capturing it, but nowhere near enough. Um, also, our soil models, not only do they not capture the change in behavior and, and fundamental characteristics, they don't even capture simple things like the stress rotations that occur. So again, if you think of a stone column, a grout injected column, or even a deep soil mix column, you're changing the stress state from a rectangular um, orthogonal stress system to a axisymmetric where you're getting your stress states in a radial direction, but you've also rotated your primary um, your sigma one from being vertical to being um, horizontal um, radial out. And in the same time, your sigma threes dropped from being your horizontal um, K naught type pressure to being a, a hoop stress and quite likely very close to zero. Um, our soil models don't recognize that. And yeah. yet, for so many problems, that actually becomes um, a problem. And I think with that, we have to recognize, in my grandfather's day, everything was based on safety. We did not want failure of any form or fashion. Today, while safety is still paramount, we are judged on serviceability. So... You know, we look at the Chicago liner tunnels. People didn't care if the ground settled 450 millimeters. They just had an army of people going around, jacking up the buildings, putting fill underneath to fill in the void. Today, you'll have an army of lawyers chasing you if the building settles uh, by 25 millimeters. Uh, and that, that's something that we have to bear in mind. And our ground improvement techniques, our modeling needs to adapt to that change in, in, in focus. And this is where small strain stiffness, CPTUs, DMTs, plus the seismic add-ons all become really, really important, as well as the modeling. And, you know, to the academics, it's getting that... Um, getting those models to a point where we can actually start relying on that small strain of behavior and that transition from small strain to large strain and, and, and capturing those sorts of things and not capturing them in, shall I say, well-behaved soils like London clay, but on real soils like the tropical soils you have, will, will have in Brazil because they're very different. Or sorry, the rules are very different. It's the same yeah. framework. It's just the the it's the rules that are very different. Yeah, I'd like we I would like to thank uh, Concresol Engenharia that made that question, and I I did mention them. So the, the answer is perfect, great, and the thoughts uh, gives uh, give us the, the the direction to to think that we have to consider the challenge of the lawyers <laughs> <laughs> it's going to become a very very big problem um you know we we look in awe at the u.s where they've just spent uh, past the bill to spend was at 1.2 trillion dollars on infrastructure that's the easy bit um uh, the problem is all of the infrastructure that they have to rebuild is now an urban environment and all the lawyers will be looking at it with eagle eyes and you know any impact outside the corridor is going to be a problem so yeah. the 1.2 trillion is a fraction of what they're going to need yeah that that's ha starting to happen here in brazil too and we don't it's have that much point. money. So now we have Mr. Manuel Silva with a great question. Uh, you, in your experience in Australia, how has uh, geophysics been used to evaluate uh, soil improvement in foundations? 
Could you share some of this experience? Um, geophysics generally is a much maligned and underutilized tool. Um, uh, I have to say that, you know, up, up front, I use geophysics a lot and I like using geophysics to help prove um, ground improvement because it tells us, can tell us quickly a lot about what's happened or not happened as the case may be. And it's much more reliable than straight CPT or SPT or, or anything else. H having said that, um, what I've come to realize because of the interactions between a ground improvement, it can also be quite misleading. Um, a study I've done some time ago, which I have not written up, and it needs to be written up, um, demonstrates that you can create stress shadows in your ground improvement pattern. And we have picked that up. So just because you may have a poor result from either CPT or, or geophysics, doesn't actually mean the ground improvement hasn't been successful. It might have been very successful, but you've just hit one of these um, stress shadow shadows. And that's something, you know, that ties into the earlier comment about understanding the, the ground improvement, what it does, and limitations of our soil models. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, when you have to uh, verify the efficiency of, of what you were expecting, and then you find with some regular uh, tests that you didn't get that much improvement, so you get a little confused. <laughs> We were very confused when we had that, and that was before I, I did my study. And my colleague at the time was pulling his hair out. How, how can this be? And um, it's only when I did the study that I realized that, hey, that might be genuine. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it was really, really interesting. Great. Uh, we would like, once again, thank you for your time. But I have a lot of questions here. I'm going to go straight ahead. <laughs> we are enjoying more than you. We are going to, you're going to have to be uh, at the beach by someone <laughs> later because you're going to be tired, but we are going to ask. <laughs> so please, uh, please do. I'm more than happy to contribute. Great, great. Thank you very much. So Mr. Diego is uh, challenging you now. Uh, with a personal question regarding the, our current uh, modern practice of geotechnical engineering, what would you say are the best resources or advances uh, you, uh, your late grand grandfather would be mostly impressed with? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start off in saying that I would cons he would almost certainly consider our dependence on computers to be a backward step uh, rather than a forward step. Um, I, I th suspect that from a theoretical point of view, the development of 3D consolidation um, and a better understanding of plasticity is probably some of the bigger ad advances and particularly being able to use that in day-to-day in -day practice. I think probably one of the best tools that we have today that he didn't have would be geotextiles. Oh, great. Um, that's probably the single biggest thing you know you look through his history you know everything else you know we we look and say look at uh, our stone columns we look at all of these sorts of things actually he 
did a lot of that sort of thing, albeit not with such sophistication or anything else, but there were adaptations of that way back in, in his time. Um, so it's, it's focusing more on, on like the geotextiles. Now to do what we do with a single layer of geotextile, he needed multiple layers of, of sand and, and gravel. Um, which just wasn't readily available in, in all areas. Um, and I don't know what it's like in, in Brazil, but I'm get, guessing in some areas, crushed rock is at a premium. Um, other areas, it's going to be readily available. Um, it's one of the challenges in New Zealand, uh, for example, is many parts of New Zealand, you just go down to the local river bank and you've got a ready supply of, of gravel. You just need to put a few sharp edges on it. Auckland and Northland, eh, nah. Rock is really, real good quality rock is very expensive um, because all the basalt's either built on or it's already been quarried. And other rock is... 20, 30, 40 meters down. Um, so, yeah. Great. Uh, I suspect he would say something like that. Are you still there yet? <laughs> 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 uh, I lost here. Let's see. Uh, of the countries you have uh, worked by Arup, which has been the most challenging in soft soil improvement? Could you share the difficulties and how it was solved? Um, Manuel Silva did that, that question. Yeah, that's 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 a tricky one. Um, Soft soils in an urban environment are always very difficult. Uh, you know, Singapore, for example, they are doing massive um, metro projects right through the city, and, and you're dealing with um, soft clays. You've got five, 10 meters of fill on top. The clays are still consolidating and yet it's all urbanized and so that creates all sorts of major difficulties you know just trying to keep everything operational etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah the singapore approach nowadays is to do pump in vast amount of grout as jet grouting and stuff like that which actually creates its own problems because the temperature effects from the grout setting can create massive amounts of heave um, and lateral displacements as, as well as you're heaving the soil you you know let's face it cements not exactly an environmentally friendly substance not at all. um i i often prefer to take a, a more gentle approach using um, preloads and, and wick drains. Nowadays, I'm looking a lot more carefully at understanding what is the apparent past pre-consolidation pressure? Am I going to exceed that? If I'm not going to exceed that, why do I need to do any serious uh, ground treatment? If I'm going to ex exceed it, how can I stage works? How can I put in ground improvement, whether it's wicks or or deep soil mixing or grout injected columns to minimize the, the impacts? Um, I think the biggest problem is usually when people jump in without understanding the ground conditions and, and, and then you have to retrofit um, issues. And, and there are projects where I worked on where we've got people who put in a bit of preload, 
oh yeah, a bit of piles, and we'll put in a, um, some grout injected columns, and oh, that's um, pushed the soil sideways, it's broken the piles. The piles are already in, the structure's already in. Now we have to go and, and then try and retrofit everything to, to deal with that. So that's usually the biggest challenge is when you don't take a holistic approach to the project. Great. Uh, we are coming to the next, to the last question, but not the least. And it's a great one. Next month, we in Brazil will celebrate the Terzag Day, October the 2nd, I think. Correct yep. me if I'm wrong. Could you share a little with us what Terzag represents for you? This is Concursolo Engenharia question. Well, that's going to be a, a warm-up question because I will be presenting to the ASCE on, on Terzaghi Day. Um, exactly that sort of question. Um, I have to say I have very mixed feelings. No, obviously, Carl was my grandfather after all. Um, so there's the family um, thoughts, I, I guess is the way to put it. Um, professionally, it's been a challenge because I'm not necessarily measured against my peers, but I'm measured against Carl, which is very difficult for anyone to, to live to. And I think that's why I spent 20 years, 25 years, uh, not, it was 20 years in Auckland. It gave me a chance to develop on my own without the constant uh, measurement against a very, very high standard. Um, okay, people might argue that I didn't need to be afraid of that. Um, many people do. Um, but yeah, it's a, a constant, constant challenge. Um, but I think a bigger challenge, and this is a challenge for the profession, is we need to look at our luminaries of the past, recognize what they've done and build on it, not stop there um, and in fact Carl himself would be saying exactly that is we need to strive to do better all the time you now we he set a foundation we need to build on that foundation and there's lots and lots and lots of scope to do that um, I have a, an entire lecture uh, 45 minutes on cons you know, looking at consolidation theory, where it's been, how it's developed, what we need to do on the future. And that's only just scratching the surface uh, and, and looking at, at some of the things that he was involved in in the past. You know, he would be saying every branch we could be pushing and developing much, much further. And we shouldn't rely on them to, to solve the problems. We need to develop new things, building on the knowledge they gave us. Great. As we saw today, you are honoring his uh, legacy uh, this, with this great presentation. It was excellent for all of us. I'd like to thank you in the name of uh, Geotecnia Brasil and all the audience uh, of the friends that were here. So we are finishing the event and we invite everybody for the Terzaghi Day of the GEO Institute of American Society of Civil Engineers. And it's going to be uh, October the 2nd. Mr. Sergey, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for all of us to have you here. And we hope to see you soon. Thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you very much and um, have, have a good evening, everyone.